we're going to look at hacking web servers. Web servers can be attacked at many levels. You can try to log into them if you have access to SSH or remote desktop or what have you. You can also try to break in via the other operating system in other ways by what services people have on them. Or you can try to break in directly via the web or packages running on top of the web. So there's many different ample opportunities for hacking web servers. There have been many web server hacking challenges posted on the internet and over time from people trying to get people to break into Microsoft-based web servers, Linux-based web servers, and even Mac-based web servers. Usually people end up being successful. The best way to do it, however, is often not to do a frontal assault on the web server itself, but it used to be that you would come sideways at it. So somebody broke into the Microsoft one by actually finding out that it was available via Microsoft Windows file sharing protocol and they mounted the drive. They were able to actually mount the administrative C dollar drive and then they defaced the website by just modifying the files on disk. Right? Somebody issued a Mac one and they said, well, Macs are much more secure. Nobody will be able to break into our Macintosh and deface the web pages. So they issued a challenge and they offered quite a prize if anybody did that and somebody did that. They took advantage of an additional third party vendor package that had been installed on the Mac web server that provided a scripting language. They knew about a flaw in it, a zero day, and they used it, and they, got, they claimed the prize. So there's often, often multiple ways that you can break into web server. But today, one of the most fruitful appears to be the applications running on top of it. The web servers themselves are usually reasonably secure these days. They get fixed quickly. So if you've got an IS or an Apache bug, the system administrators pretty quickly patch those. What they don't often patch is the, all the other, you know, software that runs on top of the web server itself. So things like Drupal and Joomla, you know, um, MediaWiki and other packages that people install. And then they install things into that, like applications that run on top of Drupal and Joomla, et cetera. And MediaWiki. So talk about web servers. You've got vulnerabilities in the clients. You've got vulnerabilities in the servers. You've got scripting languages at both ends, which are, you know, fertile ground for vulnerabilities. And then you've got all kinds of other uh, processes that are spawned off by the servers and the clients. In addition, you can attack them in the middle. You can provide downloadable content so that people can download malicious content. You can try to infect people who drive by, called a drive-by, you know, web attack, et cetera. So we'll look at the common vulnerabilities, the server security models, and some of the tools and attacks used against them, right? Then patching them and other countermeasures. This is your basic diagram of how the web works, right? Well, this is a little more than a basic diagram. So there's been a little complexity introduced here. In the original days of the web, you had, right, web client and the web server, and mostly all your interaction was with that. But quickly it went beyond a two-tiered model, right, to a three-tiered model where web client contacts web server, and the web server then goes and fetches information from a database somewhere, right? Wants to show you prices, or it wants you to be able to order merchandise and services over the web. So your standard, you know, uh, dot com economic site model right here. Now here we've got a web server and it's got a bunch of web applications running on the server. So there's some server side processes. Sometimes there'll even be more servers in the back end, a whole variety of different middleware servers. So the web server may communicate via web services and other communications channels with other middleware servers and then they'll be communicating with the database and serve you things back. You probably won't know what's back behind here because you only get to see the public facing website. Sometimes in fact web servers are composed of multiple servers but they present a united front. So they're using inverse proxies and other web servers, web farms, load balancers, all kinds of stuff can be occurring back here. This is supposed to represent the firewall, right? So our traffic is coming through the firewall, it's coming through on port what? Or 443, right? So this is, should be the only port we should be able to see on the web server. If you can run an Nmap scan a web server and you find other ports lit up, that's bad. That means they're letting you through to the NetBIOS ports and other ports potentially. If you can tell that's a Windows box and you can see port 139 or 445, then you can try to break, take it over by, you know, mounting file shares and things like that. All right. Through these web apps, you can find vulnerabilities. And one goal is often to break through the web server, break through these applications, and actually get into the database. Why get into the database? Because normally, they shouldn't be leaving any really good information around on the web server. If you break into the web server, then you can probably intercept other people's sessions. 
And if they're doing credit card transfers, you might be able to snag a few credit cards. That would be good, right? Today, many people outsource and they, they uh, have offloaded all their credit card transactions. Why? Because it's just such a pain to be in compliance with PCI, right? You have to suffer with all these restrictions. You have to go through all this you know, careful auditing on a yearly or, or oftentimes more than a year, more times than once a year basis, et cetera. It's far easier to just outsource that to somebody else. So a lot of people outsource their credit card you know, processing and such to PayPal, uh, VeriSign, and other you know, processors that will process your credit cards for you. You have to pay a small fee for that, but it's worth it, believe it, to not have to handle credit cards or store them or have to deal with any of that stuff. But you still have security problems on here if you're selling goods and services, right? For one thing, they could hack into your web server and they could modify the URLs and the links that lead to the credit card payment stuff so that they lead you, the customers to malicious sites, right? So even if you're not processing credit cards here, if somebody hacks into your site and they hack your pages, what happens if they change the link that says, okay, click here to complete your credit card purchase? And instead we send them to some you know, hacker site somewhere. So they still have to pay attention to security. They can't be completely insecure even by getting rid of all their credit card processing. Once, sometimes the ultimate goal is to get to the database because that's where all the good stuff is. And you can do other stuff if you can get into the database, right? You could look up records, you can create records, you can create tables, you can delete records. Sometimes you can even break through to the shell there. And there's some built-in stored procedures in both SQL Server and in Oracle to do that. I don't know about MySQL. So these are some of the top web threats, and some of these are client-side, and some are server-side, right? Drive-by downloads from mainstream websites. People, some people know, and some users sort of know, that if you go to malicious websites, or you go to really shady websites, like porn sites or whatever, that you're likely to get infected by something. You're likely to, to have at least the website try to maliciously infect your machine with malware, right? But if you're going to legitimate above ground sites that you wouldn't be you know, embarrassed to tell people that you go to, then you shouldn't really be infected. But over the past several years recently, people have started to get infected by going to regular websites. Why? Getting infected by drive-by downloads. Well, here's what happened to us at Yale. You know, we had several high notoriety uh, cases that occurred in the press. So a lot of our employees during the day would go to newspaper sites or the local television station site, WTNH.com, or they'd go to our register, NewHavenRegister.com, to read stories about it during the day or whatever. There's high-profile court cases and things like that. And then all of a sudden we noticed that a lot of the users who are going to the newspaper site, NHRegister.com, were getting infected. And then we traced it back to the banner ads that were showing up on their pages. It turns out that malicious hackers were going out and they were renting out banner ads on, through places like DoubleClick and some of the other banner ad companies. And when they were showing the banner ads, they were actually showing them banner ads that were infected with malware or that would then redirect to malware. And that would then download the malware to people's machines and infect them. Or people would click on the banner ads and they'd be taken to sites where they got infected as well. So we actually had to block our local newspaper site for a time to stop our machines from getting infected. You know, we said people cannot go to the local, you know, New Haven Register newspaper site because so many of the PCs are actually getting infected by drive-by downloads. Eventually, we told the newspaper about it, and at first they were somewhat hesitant, but finally they realized that it was happening to their customers. So, you know, even legitimate sites can end up being a problem because they're, you know, making some of the real estate on their web page available for ads. Attacks are heavily confiscated, dynamically changing, often changing... Um, you know, the malicious websites, the DNS names, the IP addresses, et cetera. Attacks are sometimes now targeting browser plugins, right, instead of the browser directly. Lots of people install browser plugins for PDFs, right, Flash, other Adobe file formats. What are some other browser plugins people install? IE actually has the ability to render a lot of the Office documents inside the web browser itself, right, in IE. There's lots of ActiveX controls. There's lots of JavaScript applets. 
other executable types that can be handled by browser plugins. Misleading applications infecting users. SQL injection attacks. This has been the most common way in which to break into websites in the past several years. Maladvertisements redirecting users to malicious websites. So number one and number two were really combined for us. And explosive growth in the number of unique malware samples. That makes it really hard to protect against them with antivirus. In fact, some people are saying antivirus is ineffective or useless. It's not protecting us these days. Well, it's not protecting us against zero day malware. And there's lots of it because people are just custom coding or slightly modifying malware all the time. Antivirus software is really good at doing what? Protecting you against all the known antivirus that's out there that the vendors have seen for a while and they've built signatures for. It's not good at protecting you against zero days. 